Dr. Sarah, it's lovely to have this chat with you. I'm really excited to learn more from you. I've listened to you on multiple podcasts that I've been learning from, and you are just a wealth of knowledge in all things quantum and circadian. So we're going to do some deep dives and we'll talk about the transition into winter and, and how we can embrace that because I'm at a pretty Northern latitude here in the United States. And I think you are too, where, where you live. So um, I've... I've always been sort of dreadful of winter. I've lived in Wisconsin my entire life. And it's just now that I'm like learning to embrace some of the lovely things about winter. So welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Oh, it's lovely to be here, Shanna. I love your work. So it's a great pleasure to have a chat with you. Oh, thank you. Well, why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got so involved in the quantum space and circadian health? Okay, I'll be... I can, like a whirlwind tour, even though we're expecting a hurricane here in a moment. So yes. uh, I started off as a scientist. So I did genetics and biochemistry as a as a degree. Then I did a PhD and it was in biophysics and molecular biology. And that's when I learned about light. Uh, but I didn't really understand anything about light and human health. I just knew about light and, and biochemistry and chemicals and things. And after that, I worked on statins and cholesterol, which is a bit more biological. So that's quite a sort of big topic, which um, we're probably not going to go into today. Then after that, I got kind of tired of science because I'd started to see through a lot of the, these narratives and how it was money driven and public publishing was just like an agenda to sell or try to pretend that medication was the only answer for things and which I knew wasn't true. So I left that and I became a Pilates teacher because I think movement's massively important as well. There's a lot of huge quantum aspects to all kinds of movement, especially things like Pilates, the Tai Chi, Tibetan rites, animal flow, these kind of multi sort of planar movements. And of course, sort of fascia and collagen are a very quantum topic. Th then I started to learn hypnosis because people used to tell me pr really private things in the middle of a Pilates one to one. And I wanted to be able to help them. And then with that, the, with the hypnosis, it kind of like went into stage hypnosis and close up magic and all sorts of other aspects of hypnosis. But again, stuff to do with the mind and um, whatever you want to believe in. It doesn't matter if it's religion or whatever, uh, the way we think and what we we project out of our uh, minds there's a lot more to just us being a lump of meat as I always say where sort of a bioelectric being uh, we water is really important um, what we think about how we say things um, so I did that and I found it very interesting and I still don't understand hypnosis I don't think anybody fully understands consciousness um, and th then through that I got back into sort of biochemistry with things like a medical keto diet fasting uh, stuff like that uh, and all the way through this journey, like a lot of people, I thought, oh, good, I found the solution. This is going to fix everything and all my clients and me. And then it would work. And then there'd always be some kind of question would come up. Like, I think I know the answer and somebody then changes the question. So then I got back into light again. And this was, um, oh, a long time ago. I think Dave Asprey started um, making blue blockers. And then that's when I first heard about red light panels on bulletproof radio. And this was like, like, oh, eight years ago. And I, I think really the whole talking about using the sun, not all of these biohacking tools and these artificial lights was when I got uh, into Jack Cruz. I think a lot of people find circadian biology through Dr. Cruz. And this was much more organized about exactly how does the sun help? What color light? When do I go out? Why is artificial light so bad? Because... I think for people who are not a physicist, they can't really grasp this idea of how light can be a drug or how can light change my brain chemistry? How can light heal pain? How can light give me diabetes? How can light make me obese? It's sort of, we think light's just this thing that we turn a light on and now we can see. Uh, that's just from a general perspective. We've of course got the esoteric side of light, which is um, different. But then I think in lots of sort of ancient texts, especially the Bible, there's such an emphasis on how important light is, yet people tend to completely gloss over. And the same with water, that's mentioned all the time in a huge amount of sort of um, esotericism and ancient texts of all around the globe. So that's how I got back into light and water. 
Um, and then when it comes to sort of magnetism, this is something that people get very confused about, but it, it's again, another really important aspect of, of physics because really physics controls biology. And what I try to do at the moment is to make very complicated ideas simple so that people know I'm not making stuff up, yeah. uh, but also make it practical for them because I think people need to know what they're doing and why. I don't think you should just give people a protocol because otherwise, you know, they don't know why they're doing anything and they can't explain to their family or their doctor why they've got orange glasses on or why they have to rush outside as soon as the sun comes up or why they're stirring their water with a wand or putting their water outside in the sun or turning the Wi-Fi off at night. Uh, and, I, and I think also education is really important for moving forwards in this so that people can empower themselves, that they can feel like there isn't the government or a, a, a or somebody else controlling their health and they and they lose hope they think oh good i can reclaim my health and a lot of the quantum practices the same as with food luckily we choose what we put in our mouths and we choose uh within a lot of reason what we do with our lighting environment so with the exclusion of people that have to work in a place with bad lighting but they can still go outside or open the windows so i think a lot of it's about explaining to people in understandable scientific terms without being patronizing uh, but then giving them actionable tools so they can actually see results for like common problems i'd say would be mental health depression insomnia metabolic problems diabetes obesity pain skin rashes and autoimmunity i'd probably say are the commonest complaints M maybe this is the same thing that you hear uh, and just giving people additional tools to be able to regain their health so that's kind of what I'm all about and I think that's what we're going to talk about today yes yeah the most common complaints I get are I have no energy mm. <laughs> and yes. I'm overweight like those are probably the biggest and then like you said a lot of the the mental health um where I think it's just coming to light for a lot of people and just globally that there is such a huge connection with mental health to the gut and and just our overall um you know demeanor and it's not just uh you know this chemical imbalance that we've been well it is but it's caused by things that yes are in a lot of times in our control where a lot of times people oh it's just what was me I, this is genetic this these were the cards I was dealt um, so it's, it's really wonderful that people are starting to, to make these connections. Um, yeah. So thanks for your introduction. That's, that's, it's a lot of work you've done in a short period of time. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, when we, when we started the conversation, um, I think I'm, I want to say, I think I'm at the 44th latitude. I can't remember for sure, but I think that's where I'm at. Like I'm almost to Canada. And so it's lovely while we're recording this, but I know in a few months, it's just uh, it's gonna take a turn and winter can be really tough on people. So I'd love to start the conversation with just transitioning into winter and embracing it and talking a little bit about the darkness and how we can embrace that, how we can embrace more food scarcity, which we don't really experience <laughs> anymore but our ancestors did and, and how that ties into winter and then the, the lack of the sunlight um, and how we can take advantage of those things because, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think you live in a pretty Northern area also, right? Yes, I live at the 52nd latitude. That's oh, in, okay. York, so in, York, in Yorkshire. Okay. Yes. My, and my parents live in South Wales and that's about 50. And then the states okay. the, that you're describing, the sort of more northern states of the mm -hmm. US, they're about sort of 45 to 50. And then there are, I think, certain parts of Canada, are actually the 60th latitude. So there are some Canadians that it's sort of and Scotland and the very north of England, that's sort of the 60th latitude. Um, so just before people get confused, so we don't dive too deep in, if, if we think about the equator, that would be zero. And then the tropics would be sort of 20, 20th latitude. So that's where it's sort of summer in my head, it's summer all year round. Yeah. And there's lots of tropical fruit and there's very bright sunlight. And some people have to migrate there to heal because where they 
they're living. It's not just about the other things you've described, the toxins and the and the Wi-Fi and the blue light. They actually need to go somewhere like that to heal. However, there are lots of people who've got little niggles um, and they're fine living where they are. They're just looking for how can I optimize my health in, say, Wisconsin or Seattle or I think and there's not Montana's sort of that sort of northern part of, of the US as well. Uh, so the thing that you were asking about, we, I don't know, I'm not sure where to start. I think we'll start on light, light and dark because <laughs> there's a lot of emphasis on, oh, we need more and more sunlight because um, it has all these healing benefits. But the way biology works, we, everything's sort of paired that, you know, darkness is really important as well, because first of all, when it's dark, we make more or melatonin and melatonin is really important not not just for sleeping but for um things like regulating other hormones um healing the mitochondria autophagy which sort of it sounds a bit complicated but it sort of will just say taking out the trash in the cells and that's something that fasting also uh, and keto diets will increase the amount of autophagy because you also mentioned scarcity as well so so when it comes to winter it can be a really good time to optimize healing because with it being darker, it does tend to be people more likely to go to bed a bit earlier and we can really hone in on practicing our evening routines. Um, Cause when it's summer, sometimes in the UK, it can be light until 10 o'clock at night and people want to have barbecues and parties and uh, things like that. And it's not, once you are in that mindset, it's sort of harder to sleep. So w w first of all, with the dark, not, not to fear it. And I always, um, I, I don't, I can't say I like winter more than summer. I just do different things because there's different things in nature available. Uh, secondly, with the with the darkness, there also comes the cold, and I think cold um, thermogenesis is something people in northern latitudes. It's really important to do because the cold, uh, first of all, from a mental health perspective, it helps us make more neurotransmitters like dopamine and noradrenaline, and that's the same in the morning light, the UV light, the UVA. There's always UVA light around all year round, so going out in the morning after about an hour after sunrise that's still going to make you make your neurotransmitters for the daytime and then if we add cold thermogenesis onto that then we can boost the neurotransmitters more because obviously winter depression and sad is something that people complain about whereas sad is a lot of the time people trying to make an artificial summer and winter by having the heating on too high eating um sort of stodgy carbohydrate laden food where that's not the right kind of food and sitting inside too much under artificial light so your brain thinks it's summer again and having two summers is actually really bad for biology it's a really good way to age quicker so that's kind of something you have to be mindful of is to make sure that if you live somewhere where there is a specific difference in seasons you need to experience this seasonality and to embrace the cold uh, the other important thing that cold does is it's very good for insulin sensitivity and leptin sensitivity. So the brown fat that we make when we expose ourselves to cold, uh, the brown adipose tissue or the BAT, that's sort of Mother Nature's antidote to diabetes. So this is why sitting inside with a thermostat too high so we're not even thinking about blue light or the wrong food just being warm all the time is adding to this sort of diabetes problem so being able to do cold exposure and it doesn't even have to mean you have to buy some kind of cold plunge you can wear less clothes turn the heating down you can go for walks outside and because the brown fat's here and on our upper back so exposing your skin to the cold air that's sort of what i would say level one then you can do things like once you've had a shower or, or, or a bath, rather than just jumping and cuddling up in your towel, you can let yourself dry in the cold air. And that's another way to do cold thermogenesis. So that would be level one as well. I, I just go through things with levels because yeah, yeah. sometimes for, for people, it can be overwhelming if they've never heard any of this and they think, oh, no, cold. I must go out and swim in a lake or the sea in December. So that would be like level 20. But yeah. um <laughs> So that's that's the first sort of beginning of doing how do I do cold thermogenesis in the winter in certain places like Canada, the UK, you, you can run a bath and leave it overnight and then get in it the next morning and it's going to be cold. And then you can sort of immerse yourself because as soon as you start to get into water and make yourself cold, that's totally different to letting the air cool you. So the water's always better. Then because um, being cold is sort of going to be metabolically stimulating, it's uh, another way to 
um, sort of get not like a workout, but it's a metabolic stimulus in the winter because some people get very sort of down and they need something to pep them up a bit. So using cold is a good way to sort of um, wake yourself up in a natural way without having sort of five coffees and things like that. So, so there's lots of ways we can use the cold in winter. And the other thing about the body is I think sometimes people always ask me, well, what temperature should I make it? And sometimes you want to make it the temperature in which it is naturally in your environment. So say doing a sort of 32 Fahrenheit or two degrees C cold plunge in Costa Rica is very unnatural because it's a very warm place. Whereas doing something like super cold like that in Canada or Iceland or Norway, it's kind of the people who live there and the environment there is, is very, very cold. But, but on the other hand, we have to treat cold thermogenesis like exercise and people wouldn't suddenly just do an hour of CrossFit if they haven't exercised for five years. So that's why I mentioned there's lots of gateways into doing cold thermogenesis and you don't want to you know, shock your body or overdo it. Then the other important thing about cold thermogenesis is it's very important and anti-inflammatory because uh, some people tell me they ache more in the winter. And also it's um, if you, as long as you don't go crazy with it, it can be very helpful for immunity as well. So th there's a huge amount of cold thermogenesis we can do because on a sort of much deeper biological level, when we expose ourselves to the cold, we make UV light inside ourselves so we can make melanin and um, get the benefits of sunlight, but from the light we made from our cells. So it's almost like Mother Nature gave us a different tool in winter. If there's not as much sun in these northern latitudes, then we can make our own light using things like cold thermogenesis. And then for, for places like California or, or Florida and the, to some extent Georgia, where I am at the moment, and Equatorial, they, they don't have a seasonality. So what they would do in the winter, it would just be bear in mind that fruit's very seasonal. So, you, you know, you shouldn't be eating the tropical fruit all year round if you're there because it doesn't grow there all the time anyway. But then that's a different sort of scenario. We're sort of talking about the northern latitudes. So, so that's sort of how to, in a sort of briefly, how to use dark and light, uh, sorry, dark and cold. The, the other important thing, the more north we go towards the poles, the more magnetic it gets. And then there is something called Birkeland currents. And there's, there's lots of interesting things about this, the planet. And it's sort of more electric because uh, and more magnetic the higher north that we go. So that means we have to use grounding more as a tool in winter because magnetism is something that massively confuses people and, and me included as well uh, at some time. But then what we can do if we don't have the sun to give us energy and behave like a solar panel, we can then plug ourselves into planet Earth and behave a bit like an iPhone channel. Charges. So we're sort of thinking about drawing the electrons and the magnetism uh, from the from the Earth. So, so we have a better signal or we've got more magnetism the more north we go. So, again, that's something or, or south, so like the closer to the South Pole or the North Pole. So so where, where you are, the 45th, you ha don't have as much magnetism as I would. And then uh, and people in, in sort of Scandinavian countries, they've got even more magnetism. So that's why grounding is really important as well in the winter. And people will then say, oh, no, but it's really cold and uh, and <laughs> things like that. So that's where things like leather sh leather sole shoes can be really helpful because you don't need to go outside in bare feet in the snow because right. you know that is, would, would your toes would be or your touchies as I call them would hate that and remember you can ground by touching concrete uh, sometimes certain wood will even ground you can touch plants uh, that's going to help you uh, ground as well and also. Uh, people ask me all the time, oh, is this shoe grounded? Will this bench ground? And it's very cheap to buy a grounding meter. You can buy them on Amazon. Intuition Physician has a grounding meter. So sometimes you have to be your own detective or scientist and work out for yourself. Does my basement ground? Does my concrete driveway ground? And you might find you've got somewhere in your garage um, where you can ground or your basement might be grounded or your bench might be grounded or you might have a metal ground. So you might have a fence that will ground. So, so it's all about how can we get energy from the environment in the winter? Otherwise, exactly what you were talking about, Shanna, at the beginning, people's problems, sort of um, obesity and stuff. People will think the body will think, oh, no, I'm not getting sun. Where can I get energy from? Oh, food. And then we set off this sort of 
uh, winter sort of eating uh, problem. And then that leads us into what you were talking about before about scarcity, that uh, if we mess up our light and our grounding and our water and our magnetism in winter, our, our body will think, oh, I need food from somewhere else. So that's when these sort of winter cravings will start. And of course, there's things like Christmas and Thanksgiving right in the middle of it just to tempt people. Um, and when it comes to sort of scarcity, actually, I was telling you before I went to Quest to just run some labs. And, and I know quite a few people who said to me, oh, I couldn't do that because I couldn't miss my breakfast. So there are lots of people who are so geared to, oh, no, I can't possibly miss a meal and things like this. Whereas actually in winter, it's a really good time to experiment with a, a keto diet or fasting because it matches the environment. And, and for people who it's, who've been toying with the idea or oh, I tried keto in the summer and it didn't quite work, or I tried to fast. Maybe you were doing it at the wrong time of year. So this idea of um, living in a time of scarcity, our biology is geared to that. It's sort of expecting fasting and scarcity. So, so in some ways, I actually find if I ever attempt to make a bikini body, it's always easier, I think, in the winter to do it rather than somewhere like the end of summer or, or, or fall because your body's seeing all this fruit and it wants it all to get fastened up for the winter. Whereas we are, the body actually expects uh, scarcity. And also the other thing that's important is vitamin D because we store, if we store it in fat and the liver and, and muscle as well. And if people lose a bit of body fat in winter, they're going to liberate the vitamin D out of the fat um, that they collected. But vitamin D is a humongous topic as well. Yes. Um, and, and, not, and sometimes not to fear um, not having vitamin D in the winter, because if you made enough and you've got enough in storage, because remember, when you go and get a lab test, the vitamin D that most people measure is the storage form, not the active form. So you're measuring your storage form and that's going to fluctuate throughout the year because in winter it's supposed to go down because it's turning the storage form into active form. Because there are people asking me already getting in a panic about vitamin D. Uh, so that's something uh, if you made a lot in, in the summer, then don't worry about it. Your body is all it'll just turn it into active form. And also there are foods that contain vitamin D like salmon and liver and sardines and, and egg yolks and stuff like that. So, and then, uh, of course, for people who've only just got into this now, you can buy medical grade ultraviolet B lights. Um, there are three different ones that. I think can be beneficial. Um, and then is there anything else we need to cover about not fearing winter and using it as a, as something helpful? No, I think that that was the thing, the food scarcity, the darkness, the cold, and then you even touched on the fasting and the ketogenic approach working better in the winter. And it's so funny because I'm 48 years old and for the, I could not figure out, like I would always my weight has stayed pretty stable my for for most of my adult life but i could never figure out i'm like how come all you know people say you should lose weight in the summer cuz you're more active and you're outside and you're getting all the sunlight energy and i would always go up a few pounds in the summer i'm like i can't i can't figure this out and then i would drop it in the winter and i'm like i feel like i'm the opposite of everybody and it was just like in the last couple of years where i'm like okay that makes so much more sense because you are supposed to, we have an abundance of food in the summer and the fall, and it makes so much more logical sense for you to gain a little bit of weight in those months. But I struggle with, I mean, it, my whole life I couldn't remember. And I'm, you know, I have more season like change of seasons than a lot of people do um, in other parts of the world. But that was definitely something that, that I experienced. And Going back to the neurotransmitters, because I think that's really fascinating. And I've been educating my community on UVA and when to find that in the atmosphere. And thank, thank goodness that stays, you know, in the winter months when we when we lose UVB at this northern area. But I did not know about the, the thermogenesis with the cold and how that also makes neurotransmitters. So that's fascinating to me and just another reason to embrace the cold and um, you know, I've always been one of these people, like I'm not, I live very North, but I'm not one of these people who just stays inside when it's cold. Like I dress for it and I go out pretty much every day. And my mother-in-law always likes to say, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> so I'm always out there, but, um, you know, there's just a few mistakes that I would make. Um, I walk pretty much every morning. I see a lot of sunrises, but there's a lot, you know, I was wearing sunglasses most of my life and, um, you know, that morning exposure is 
wonderful. And I did my body a lot of good, but like most people, then it's like, it's dark at 4 35 PM. I'm, you know, you're flipping on the lights, you're up and you're creating that, that summer environment, like you talked about until nine, 10 o'clock. And, um, you just didn't get the melatonin production that your body's meant to undergo in the winter. So yeah, that just pulls everything together. And, um, before we go on to the next topic, just touching on one, one thing that we discussed what the food scarcity and the types of food. And we've been talking a lot about, you know, looking to your environment for cues on what, what you should or shouldn't be eating. I don't like the should and shouldn't, but um, what's going to optimize your body is I guess a better way to put it. And I do get a lot of questions. Um, and I just feel, I'm sure you feel like this too. It's like nutrition things. I feel like there's never a yes or no. <laughs> there's never a yes or no question. Like somebody say, like, oh, or banana is good for me. I'm like, well, where do you live? What time of the year? <laughs> you know, it's like, there's, there's just always this so much complication. So if we can just keep things simple, um, and you know, are there, are there certain foods to look for in the winter though? Cause I know a lot of people are like, well, I can't just eat meat all winter. Um, but are there certain produce, um, fermented foods, those sorts of things that you recommend at more Northern latitudes? Um, you know, I know that I'm not going to be eating guava and watermelon and that sort of thing very often in the winter months, if at all, but are there certain, uh, you know, plant foods that you can point oh, people to? Oh, oh, definitely. Cause mushrooms grow in winter time and, and okay. like in, in, uh, in the UK, they, they're out in October up until December, different species, but, but also seafood as well is really important because uh, um, we're an island in the UK and then places like Maine and um, places on the coast there obviously have abundance of, of seafood and that provides electrons because of the DHA. So I agree that like, um, and also uh, interestingly, the seasonal and local eating animals and um, fish are seasonal, like obviously goose comes into season because um, it's, I think it's on the 29th of September, isn't it? It's the feast of St. Michael. Um, and then people have goose again or Michaelmas or have goose again at Christmas. And that's probably a super um, nutrient dense um, on multiple levels. And it's very, and, and then you don't see it again for, for a long time. Obviously eggs and things, they're still around. Um, and then with, with produce, there's still always things which grow. Like I've got apple trees in my in my backyard and um, they don't finish fruiting until probably December. Uh, and then you've got things like root vegetables. Brussels sprouts are always around. Uh, I'm a big fan of cabbage, cabbagey things. So, so there are a, a lot of um, kind of produce around. And there might not be the tastiest things, but I think looping back to what you said, because people do massively, in my view, overcomplicate food. And I just think... Uh, it's easier to do it in the summer and the spring and, and the fall because there's sort of more variety with produce. But then there are some people that don't do very well anyway with um, plants. I, I'm not against them. And the more I've got into quantum and the more I've really honed in on seasonal and local eating for different sort of things that I'm working on, it does actually make a difference. And some people can't grasp the concept of why eating a banana in Seattle is bad for you, but it's to do with your body's not expecting um, that because because food is light and energy and there's quantum information, magnetic and light programmed into food. And then if you then eat it and put this information in your mitochondria, which are your batteries, um, it's going to really confuse them. And when we confuse the body, we get inflammation. And like you said, right at the beginning, uh, uh, one of the chief complaints is, oh, I haven't got any energy. So, so, this, so, so that would be thinking, OK, I don't have very much energy or I want lots of energy. My mitochondria make energy. So how can I do things to please them? And what can what what things can I do that will really annoy them and then stop doing that? So that's why it might sound stupid, the seasonal eating, but on, on an environmental level and supporting local business, like a, a sort of a higher purpose level, it's important. But from a food being information and energy, not just macros, I think that that's where if you start getting into being very fussy about season and local and actually try it like I've just been doing for the past three weeks. It does, you, you feel the difference. And 
um, sometimes people are just don't know how they could feel because they've never tried changing things. But, but then I, I do agree. Oh, I can't just eat meat from um, October until February. So that, so again, the seafood's important, the root vegetables, the brassicas, the mushrooms. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many fruits that do actually still grow in winter. In, in the UK, we have rose hips all the way up until December um, and then I've got friends who do things like sprouting, you know, they'll grow, um, they'll sprout different, a whole selection of things. So, so you can, to some extent, you know, grow things inside. Uh, I wouldn't say sort of under artificial light, but, you know, you could get into sort of making your own food like that. Um, but also I think what's important is some, and I didn't mention this earlier, is if you start thinking, oh, no, winter's coming, I'm going to get depressed, I, I can't just eat meat, you've already get, put yourself into a no mindset. So, you know, so, sometimes it, it's a good idea to think, OK, let's just do an experiment because I, I am the same as you. I, I'm, I haven't got any issues with carnivore diet. I just don't want to do it all the time. And I've seen people do it all the time and run into lots of hormonal issues. However, there are lots of people that it's like the panacea for them. So somebody who might be saying, oh, no, I don't want to eat meat all winter might be one of those people that really resonates with carnivore. But they've just never tried it because they talked themselves out of it. But but like anything, if you're, if you're eating in a certain certain way and you're feeling worse and worse then obviously you need to change things um as well so yeah there there is produce and that, and that, then of course there's sort of different things you can do with with uh, raw dairy you can make your own kefir you, you know the the cheese and raw cheese and things around sort of all all year within reason um then there are other things that you can ferment like kimchi and kombucha that's sort of more of a sort of tea like drink so there's lots of different things and, and sauerkraut again there's like we can see there's a big cabbage theme going on that there's lots of things you can do with cabbage and for, for people that want to buy um live food you, you have to read the label because sometimes it will be pasteurized obviously it's killed everything but it and, and they'll still sell it in the shops even though it's pretending to be live um so yeah there's lots of things you can do the other question i get asked all the time with people is oh i've got five plum trees in my backyard C can i can them and store them and eat them in winter and and that's one of those difficult ones because obviously it's local it's from the right place but then you know it's not the light environment's not quite right but really you and the plums kind of live lived together yeah. in the same area so it's not as confusing as buying a plum from from the supermarket because it could have come from the other side of the world also i don't like unnecessarily wasting food i think if a plant or an animal is given its life for me i i can you know i don't want to disrespect that i know it sounds really bizarre and weird but that's just me i i think it's sometimes better not to and the buddhists are like this as well um about wasting things that sometimes if someone's going to throw away all their plums it's much better to store them and just don't gorge on them in winter because it's all about we didn't actually mention this um like clearly that when we move into winter the amount of carbs that we need drastically drops so i think with people in the canning if it's your your canning or um you know your frozen fruit just don't gorge on it but i would still say that it's something that there are certain people that find they do thrive in the winter on a small amount of carbs but you know not to overdo it and I think like you probably get the same question about the canning and the storage. And I've thought about it over and over and over. What's the best solution? So, so that's, you know, I'm not I'm not saying I'm right. I just at the moment think that's what's the best way to approach um, the stored food, because there are other things that people pickle, like onions and stuff. People will um, harvest them. I think onions are a bit like cabbages and things. There are certain varieties that grow at, at funny times of the year as well. Uh, but I think with with things like that, it is OK to have these in, in the winter because our ancestors would have done stuff like that, but just not to go crazy with them. So yeah. What are, your, what are your thoughts there? Because I think well, that's, sometimes that's kind of what I go back to also, like what would our ancestors have done? They went to probably just dumped all the plums or the apples. Yeah. You know, they would have found ways to make them work throughout the winter months and and just had less of them and it's really interesting um you know people don't don't think about n not needing as many carbs in the winter than they do in the summer so i'm glad that you brought that up and i know for me i even i just see my cravings like the types of foods that i'm craving just shift and i've seen that this month like we're recording at the end of september and it's been unseasonably warm 
like eight, 70s and 80s and sunny and beautiful this whole month, which I am not complaining about at all. Yes. But it's weird how like just with I, I, it must be less sunlight, um, you know, the the darkness coming. I'm like craving soup. I don't like I in the summer, I like want to eat a salad pretty much every day. I get my food box, my local food box, and I just use what's ever in there with, with some sort of meat. And my, my family does a ton of hunting. So we have a lot of our own game meat that we know it's like from our land and our property. Um, we know exactly where the animals been, but it's weird. Like, I'm like, I want, it's 80 degrees, but I want soup. <laughs> I don't want these salads anymore. And you just, if you're actually truly in, intuitive with your body. And, um, I feel like the more you practice the circadian stuff, you just like your, your cravings are different. Your appetite's different. Um, and I've noticed it, like I'm, I've been pretty in tune with my menstrual cycle, but I've noticed even with that, I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I truly do get a little bit hungrier after I ovulate. And, um, I didn't really feel those things until I started incorporating these practices as often as I do now. Oh, definitely. I know. I, I know. I've seen lots of your food pictures on Instagram, so <laughs> I kind of know. But that's that's a good point because you've actually reminded me all about menstrual cycles because they um will their light depends. And some people freak out because their cycles are different lengths in yeah. the summer and the winter. But if, it, of course, it's going to be because we've got um, less light, and then obviously cortisol is stimulated by light in, in a good and a bad way. That's why uh, another reason darkness is really helpful. Like just going in the dark under a weighted blanket if you feel really stressed can bring your cortisol down so not to freak out about the, the the cycles and then i think sometimes people are not sure why sitting in artificial blue light in the winter is going to give them cravings they, they sort of can't grasp it and it's because it's going to steal the blue light's going to drop their dopamine and that's like a gateway in, now into addiction so it might not be just food that somebody craves when people's dopamine tanks all of a sudden old addictions can resurface because some people uh, in the winter when they're depressed like drink more alcohol or um use other things and it and it's um seems to happen only in the winter and that's another reason to be really careful about just sitting inside around the blue light you've got to bear in mind you're going to steal your dopamine and then you're more open like it can be cravings for sort of food for some people um and then other things for others and i think actually you just mentioned about the seasonal change because before i came here it was um starting to get cold and all of a sudden i just um i was I have quite a lot of like apples and blackberries and things in my backyard and all of a sudden it got cold and I just started switching into the seafood and um, sort of more meat. Just sort of lit I didn't even realize I just woke. I didn't think, oh, I know I'm going to eat some more seafood. I just woke up and did it. Then I came to Atlanta and it was and it was really hot and um, it's interesting that you mentioned that you find it difficult to lose weight in hot weather because if I'm somewhere hot, I just am not hungry. So I'll have some breakfast, but then I'll just be a solar panel all day. But I think it's because I live somewhere where we sunlight's a luxury. So when I get my body gets somewhere where it sees the sun, it's just like, oh, give me all of this. Don't mess this up by putting food in so I always find that uh, I'm adapted I can uh, milk the environment the, uh, the cold and the dark if I need to and the magnetism but then when I do find sun my body seems to sort of think oh wow this is we've been waiting for this forever let's just suck it all in and being really grateful and appreciative of the sun um and then I just definitely didn't want the salmon or the beef or the egg yolks or whatever I was doing in the UK it was all back to the seasonal produce and it wasn't oh let me just sit down and plan everything my brain was just sort of like it just knew what I needed to buy or get and how much to eat as well because that's the other important thing I think there's not just choosing foods it's how people must ask you all the time well how many macros how much should I I eat always <laughs> always how much can I eat this food um and they want a meal plan which I have never done meal plans before for all of the reasons we've talked about I it would I mean to write somebody a meal plan it's almost impossible you need to know where they live <laughs> I mean um what season they're in what's grown near them it, it's just it's way too hard and there's no one size fits all um and um but yeah I 
if you would mind expanding, I didn't know about the menstrual cycle and the lighting changes. So did they get longer, shorter? Or is it or like they is- tend to be shorter in the summer? Okay. I often okay. um I often have like if I'm gonna have some 26 day cycles, they're always in the summer just because there's weight, there's we have summer like sun from half past four in the morning till 10 at night. So as I said before, um, we make um, more cortisol when it's brighter. And then the way sex hormones are made, we've got things like progesterone, DHEA, um, testosterone, estrogen, but also cortisol. So if your body's making slightly more cortisol, there's just not, you know, the you're going to have um, less starting material available for the other sex hormones. And I don't know the reason for this, but sometimes I think because it's more ancestrally a mating season in the summer that if 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 women had cycles a bit quicker you know the ch- you know you're, you're increasing the chances of, of fertilizing an egg because you're just having slightly more cycles because that, that's that's just like a, that there's no science in what i've just said i've just noticed it over and over w- with talking to people and then w- when when the like the days get shorter again there's a lot more darkness and like i mentioned before melatonin regulates sex hormones as well uh, along with other things like detox and fat loss as well so when it's darker i have noticed that cycle, cycles especially minor are, are going to be slightly longer uh, and not to not to freak out uh, about that because some people get really fixated oh no my cycle used to be 30 days and now it's 26 and if it's summer i'll think oh yeah it's definitely that um, and then the other important thing about disobeying mother nature in winter is pms that um, it, I found that it, it's more forgiving in the summer, say, if people eat stuff that probably isn't a good idea. Um, and if you do that a lot in winter, the, the PMS um, is potentially can be more aggressive. I'm not sure if you've noticed that with women, but I have noticed that um, if I use the darkness properly and use it as a time of rest and healing, I'm fine. But then, you know, sitting in blue light for t- too long, uh, um, overindulging on things that we shouldn't every now and again, a, l- a real mom the PMS can come. That's super interesting. And it makes perfect sense. You know, when you look at the hormonal cascade and, and what's happening, because I had a 26 day cycle, like I think it was June to August. Oh yeah, it makes sense. July yes. to August time at. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Like I'm 48. So I'm like, and I heard like they, they tend to shorten a little bit as you're starting to, you know, go into through menopause. And I'm like, oh, here we go. But then like another one's 30 days. So um, yeah, that, that is really interesting though. And, and like I said, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, I just think like the more connected you get, so this is the first winter that I'm going into like wearing the blue light. Cause I started all of this around March ish. So I had like spring and summer, but I haven't gone into a full winter. And like I had mentioned, I did a lot of things that, that were, seasonally appropriate but a lot of things that that I was missing also um so it'll be interesting to see if if you know things are different and I've never been that person that had like severe seasonal affective disorder but I think it went outside in the morning and at least got the morning light um but I'm I'm yeah it's hard I don't know if excited is the right word (laughs) for me as we're heading into winter but I don't feel like you said like sometimes you just living at a Northern latitude, you just kind of start to dread it. And, um, you know, you just, gosh, I can't wait until the days get longer. And, um, cause you don't look at winter as a, a time of healing. Most people look at it as this is the seasonal time of everybody's sick. And, um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to catch all these colds and, um, they just don't look at it, at it properly. So, um, I'm glad we had this conversation today. Cause I think, I think, I think maybe our ancestors put lots of parties and festivals in winter <laughs> to, to entertain us, but, but also I think there are other options because sometimes people People ask me about, well, can I go to Australia or New Zealand for the winter or yeah. can I go to yeah, the Canary Islands? And then also some people in um, in Seattle go to Mexico. And then I was thinking for myself, I know I'll do the opposite. I'll go to Greenland because that's like the 75th <laughs> latitude. So I was thinking that's going to be really cold and super magnetic. But then it was five thousand dollars to go to there for a week. Oh, wow. so I <laughs> well, the thing is, I think it's one of those things. Sometimes I'm always like, OK, magnetism and cold and dark is really healing in the UK why don't I just go even more north like even to the North Pole and just really milk it all up 
rather than, you know, my body would probably like that because it's the same as what I get in the UK, just times 10. Whereas yeah. I often think my, I'm half a New Zealander. So my mother's a New Zealander. So I, and I've got a New Zealand passport and, and citizenship. So technically I could try and run away from the winter every year. But then I think it goes back to uh, one of the, I was saying before, having all these summers um, and trying to avoid the winter it could be doing myself a disservice. And I also think, um, it's a really tricky question. I think, say, if somebody was listening and they've only just got into quantum now and they're really worried about vitamin D, I think that's an example of that. It's a good idea to go on vacation somewhere that's still got plenty of UV because there's plenty of sort of ultraviolet B here and and, and like um, absorb it all. Even in November, there are places you can go to get sunshine. And I think I have noticed there are certain people that even though they do everything right, they're just more dependent on the sun than others. And of course, going on vacation you've got you are going to get jet lag and you are going to have to sit in an airplane with non-native emf and you might have to sleep somewhere that's not quantumly set up but but like across the board when i've um, looked at clients and people it has shown it is better to if it's really bothering you the dark just to go away somewhere get some sun charge up your batteries you'll have to deal with the jet lag but we could do like a whole podcast on that uh, but it is kind of better than just sort of um, staying put because like I was saying, there are some people, like, I think depression is really, really serious. And if some, if going away for two weeks to Mexico or the Canary Islands is going to stop somebody having like suicidal thoughts for two months, I think it's worth it. Yes, it's going to disturb your circadian biology because all of a sudden your body was thinking, oh, it's winter and then boom, oh no, it's summer, yeah. what's going on? But then if, the, the more in train to the sun you are the more wiggle room you've got um when you move about because i ha i didn't used to travel a lot but i do a lot more now so so the more strict i am about seeing the sun the, the more the quicker my body adapts when i go into a different environment because all i've got is the sun to drive all my clocks and, and like you were saying you've got into it now in in, in march so you know you'll find that in in one year two year three year you continue to get benefits it doesn't just happen and overnight this idea of your own body clocks getting more resistant to when you move about can be helpful so that's kind of um something and i think also it depends which country you're in because i know in the states people tend to stay put more um or go within the the, the, yeah. the united states rather than leaving whereas in the uk and other places we're like a nation that, that can't wait to leave our own island and then come back yeah. Do you have any, as we close out, like, I always like to go somewhere Southern in the thick of what's, you know, of our winter, but of course you're not, you're not primed for it. You don't have, you haven't had the sun exposure on your skins. Are there any recommendations as to not sunburn when you go down since, because since you haven't been priming your skin, um, it would watching the sunset, you know, wherever you are, yeah. eyes, wherever you are yeah. be helpful. Oh, absolutely. Because wherever you are, um, even if you live in Mexico, you should always see the sunrise uh, mm -hmm. and everything because it makes a solar callus and, and it basically your body starts to expect UV light later. Because if you never saw the sunrise, wore sunglasses all the time and then just went outside and you'd sat in blue light for 20 years, of course, you're going to burn. And that opens up all of these skin sort of where people have got a big fear of the sun and it causes cancer and stuff like that. It's like, well, Maybe it's you wearing sunglasses and being in blue light all the time, never seeing the sunrise and suddenly roasting yourself in the sun and getting very burned. You know, that's not the sun's fault. That's you not behaving appropriately in it. But I think, say, if somebody um, was living in the UK or Canada or um, Montana or something and they wanted to go to Mexico for the first time, that they'd have to embrace sort of the, the really capitalize on the morning sun and then... Um, you can get sort of you can make vitamin d in places like that sort of way before noon because ideally you want the ubi over five and even the, the local people there wouldn't go out in that sort of really hot noon sun and, and also the other thing is using the shade you get loads of benefits being in the shade uh, and the way the body makes vitamin d it doesn't actually like you baking yourself you know like a jacket potato in the sun it, if it's very hot it prefers you to go out and come in go out come in go out come in um uh, and then using the shade so i think it's just about um never underestimate how important the sunrise is when you go to a new place where there's lots and lots of extra sun and if you wear sunglasses your brain thinks it's dark 
so it's not it's not expecting a load of sun on it because the, the body everything's connected and biology is all on prediction everything that our body does it always wants to know well, what's going to happen in half an hour or 20 minutes or three days how can i get ready so if you wore sunglasses and then suddenly went out in the sun it's going to not be ready and then when we talk about sunblock and stuff like that the problem with that is first of all it blocks the UV light as it's supposed to, and that just confuses the brain because the eyes are getting one signal and the place you didn't put the sun cream is getting one signal and then everything else getting something different. So it's confusing, but also the sun block, the way the optics work, it blocks the UV, but it lets more of the blue and the cyan light through the skin. So you can just get sort of like more open to basal cell carcinomas and other problems because you block one light and then more of a different color that can sort of get through um so th that's the other thing because i know people all of a sudden get kind of anxious about sunblock because when i was in cvs earlier i saw factor 80 and i've never seen that before for sunblock. oh i haven't either i've never seen it above 50 i don't even oh, no. sunblock anymore <laughs> so I, no oh my goodness that's so I'd, I'd say to people don't buy the factor 70 or 80 in cvs use clothing like cotton clothes um kaniki um swimwear um, because still a lot of light's going to get, I've tested this a few times about how much light gets through sort of cotton and stuff like that. So light still comes through to give you a signal, but it protects you enough from being burned. Then you can get things like Kanikis, which is sort of swimwear that lets light through. I have to measure everything just to see, but it's like better than nothing. Um, yeah. And then like not not to not to think the shade is not offering any benefits you know, because some people think, oh, no, I'm going for the sun. I must like lie in it for 10 hours because I've done this great big like migration to the sun. But but the shade's got a huge amount of benefit as well. And like I said, going in and out, in and out, in and out um, is is a sort of more optimal way or, or just avoid the noon sun altogether. Because for some people, it's still just way too hot and get your sun from sunrise the morning wait for it to set a little you no know, go down a bit and optimize the afternoon sun because there's still uva light in the afternoon and also in places like mexico and costa rica there's going to be plenty of opportunities to make vitamin d in the afternoon as well sure and that's what i tended to do all summer when it was really hot it would i just go in and out working you know i'd take my computer in and out and um go to the shade if it got too hot but trying to, to stay grounded. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're one of those people I'd love to just take all the knowledge and dump it in my brain. So where can people find more about you or your work? And I know you have some courses if they'd like to learn more. Oh, thank you, Shanna. Yes, I, I go by Busy Superhuman online. I've got a YouTube channel, Instagram, um, Twitter, uh, sub, Substack. So, so different things. Some people like to look at pictures. Some people like to read. Some people like short videos. Some people like long form and lots of free stuff. So I have kind of links to free PDFs of how to get started with quantum and what leptin is and, um, you know, different things. So there's plenty of free things. And I've got a membership group that is $29 a month if people want to be in a group and ask questions and have lives. And then I've got a variety of sort of affordable courses on quantum biology and then minerals and water because thankfully we didn't get into water today because <laughs> people got very confused and then also we didn't talk about deuterium either I've, that's in my quantum basics course so the quantum basics course is sort of how to do quantum biology and just stuff that I've learned over the years and like Shanna was saying, people always want a protocol. And, you know, um, sometimes you can almost make a protocol. But uh, again, it's all people can learn based on a course. Oh, I live here. So therefore I need to do this or eat that. Um, and that's uh, about it, um, really. Um, there's plenty of different things for people to, to learn from me from free or paid. It's up to them. Yeah, we didn't get it into deuterium at all. We're going to have to have you back and talk about this, that subject. Yes. We, haven't, we haven't touched on, and leptin. I mean, we had Sarah Kleiner on um, just a few weeks ago and she talked all about leptin resistance, but that's another fascinating topic that um, once you learn about that hormone, well, and all the hormones and how they interconnect, oh, life gets so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. I, th I think with deuterium, just in like a simple one, two, three, don't eat seed oils, don't eat processed food. 
and that's about you know that's the beginner's guide to avoiding deuterium yeah there <laughs> so, we go you know, because <laughs> that's the thing sometimes if we talk about something people were happily pottering along with their health and we drop a deuterium bomb and then people right. go, oh no i'm doing it all wrong i'm so confused is there deuterium in a lemon can i eat a cherry and you know they get all upset because they were yeah. doing something wrong and it's like actually you know um you weren't doing any much wrong you just needed a little tweak so we'll have to leave the deuterium um for another day yeah Oh gosh, we definitely need to have you back because I, yeah, we could sit and talk here for about 10 hours. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Divided into 10 podcasts, but I know you talk about those bombs and the bomb that got dropped on me was actually, I was listening to Sarah Kleiner's um, podcast one and she was talking about how, or I think it, uh, I saw a post on Instagram, how going to the gym at five or five 30 in the morning before the sunrise could all actually be, you know, exacerbating your cortisol issues. I'm like, what? Like, you know, like it made me mad. I'm like, that's not true. And then I'm um, like, oh, yes, it is. That makes sense. You know, once I started learning. So I, I had to, I didn't completely drop that habit, but I've modified my uh, yeah, yeah, your, routine. <laughs> yeah, your social media gives you away. But that was the same. I used to do that and think, <laughs> why isn't it working? Everybody else is getting this amazing body and I'm thrashing away at like five and six a.m. And I'm doing another workout later. And then I realized, oh yeah, it's like the, the blue light <laughs> at the gym. So I just moved the timing and then- Yeah, so that's what I did. I know. But also for people, if that's the only time they've got to exercise, I think it's better than just like, you know, eating bagels and reading the news and, um, you know, not doing anything. Yeah. So there's always, no matter what, even th I always think there's absolutely dreadful and then there's the optimum and right. then there's things in between and people have to accept. Sometimes we it's impossible to be perfect and not to not do anything at all because it's not the optimum. But right. anyway, and yes. I love to go to the gym just to because I was I'm an early riser and I have I have good energy in the morning and then it's like I'm done with it. And so I've just modified if I do go, which is not I don't go to that early morning class very often. I, I do wear my glasses. So it, so at least we have that. <laughs> and I don't I try not to do it as often as I was. And I've just moved my time a little bit. But well, thanks again for your time and your knowledge. And I'm sure um, a lot of people, this is one of those episodes you need to go and listen to a couple of times because okay. they're like jam packed full of little tidbits that, that you're going to pick up on. And I know I'm going to probably have to listen to it a couple of times too, but thanks for coming on your time today and all the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's, it's lovely to meet you in person. Yes. Uh, well, in almost person, virtually. Yes. Yes. Someday, someday we'll yes. meet. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs>